Well, welcome to another episode of Your Life Simplified. My name is George Fernandez, and I'll be the host for this episode. You know, the time of the recording of this podcast, the entire country was beginning to re- reemerge into society. And, you know, while there is cautious optimism that's beginning to spread across the country, there does seem to be an underlying anxiety as it relates to whether or not it's too soon. And on top of that, it's there's a continued level of financial anxiety that's affecting us all by what's going on in the economy. So to help us walk through and cope with this financial anxiety, I'm joined by Lindsay Bryan Podvin, certified financial therapist and author of The Financial Anxiety Solution. She also has her own podcast, Mind Money Balance. Lindsay, welcome to the show. I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks, George. It is really great to have you here. You know, as we kind of kick things off in our discussion today, I thought it would be really helpful if we start off with you sharing a little bit about yourself and why you do what you do. Absolutely. So I am, as you mentioned, a financial therapist. And my background was that I came from a clinical social work background. So here in Michigan, that means I can practice as a therapist. And I had specialized in depression and anxiety treatment. And in my own life, about, I don't know, I would say when I was 22, 23, I started to develop an interest in personal finances. And I wanted to find a way to kind of blend the two because I found with my clients who are coming in with money stressors in my therapy practice, I didn't quite have the language and I also didn't feel super ethical just doling out personal finance advice. So I wanted to find a way to bridge the gap and offer something to my clients that was more emotionally and psychologically based. So I sought out, as you mentioned, some additional training through the Financial Therapy Association and through the Center for Financial Social Work to help clients just understand that money is so psychological, it's so emotional, and there are things we can do so you can dial down your anxiety and be in a really healthy place with money so you can make wise financial choices. You're right, and a lot of people are affected by, you know, not just what's going on now, but just in You know, before all of this, you know, people will finally find themselves needing help in that area. So, you know, the other thing I thought was really interesting, though, and you didn't say this, but uh, but I'm going to share it. And that is you're one of only 50 certified financial therapists in the the entire country. Uh, That's yeah, that really surprised me. Uh, So is is this a relatively new discipline within the uh, the realm of therapists? Yeah, I, I would say we've always had financial behaviorists. Right. So when you think about marketing, you're using the psychology of money and the psychology of wants and desire to sell or market a product. So we've always known that there has been a link between what we think and how we act and how that plays out when it comes to money. But until, you know, 10 years ago, there wasn't a specific discipline that helped people to harness that in the therapeutic space. So the Financial Therapy Association has been around for about a decade And they were kind of the pioneers in really nailing down the the intersection of the two. Okay. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because I actually spoke to a therapist that I know, and she reiterated the importance of having the money conversation with the couples that she counsels. And so she kind of said the same thing, but like you, she struggled with, you know, that, that, you know, how do I help couples manage the finances when I don't really know how to really deal with that side of it. So she was really excited when I told her about the Financial Therapy Association. It was something that she had not heard of at that point in time. And so don't be surprised if she's joining your ranks here within the next couple of years. So that'll be exciting to see that that expand over time. You know, maybe it would be helpful then because the the therapies that you apply and the, and I think, steps that we're going to be talking about here in just a little while uh, – my guess it all comes from the, you know, the therapeutic approach to uh, managing finances. And so when you think of financial therapy, let, maybe we can start there and create that foundation of what exactly is financial therapy? How is it different than other types of therapy? Yeah, financial therapy is different than other types of therapy in that it's a little bit more goal-directed. So for your listeners who have attended therapy, a lot of therapy is kind of nebulous, right? You, you call a therapist or you email a therapist and you share that you want therapy. And when you ask about how long you'll be in therapy, most of the time you're going to get an answer like, it depends. <laughs> and with financial therapy, it's a little bit more goal-based and goal-directed in that the idea is obviously depends on, on the individual or the couple, but we're trying to make it solution focused. And what financial therapy does is it helps people to understand the other side of money, maybe the, the not the bookkeeping side of money, 
so they can make wise financial choices and have a really healthy relationship with their money. Okay, that's that's great. And so, we, so it, it's a kind of a big area. And I, I like what you said. You know that it's it's goal based and actually ties to what we do on the financial planning side of things. So taking a step from there, looking from financial therapy, let's kind of step into this conversation. That the kind of the the goal of our discussion today is really talk about financial anxiety, uh, because you know with with what's happened this last year, of course, and what you know what happens in people's lives when we think about financial anxiety. I, I want to dig a little bit deeper on that. And I just have to admit, m- me personally, when I first heard the term financial anxiety, my first impression, my first perception was that this is uh, for, these are folks who are money challenged. These are people uh, mm-hmm. who have found themselves in a situation where they, they've gone bankrupt because of the economic conditions. They had a catastrophic event, so it depleted their savings. They're living paycheck to paycheck. But they're people who are challenged mm-hmm. with the amount of money that they have to reach the goals and or to just put a roof over their head. But that's not necessarily the case, as I, I, I have come to learn. So can you help us understand what financial anxiety is? Yeah, financial anxiety is feeling nervous, anxious, or on edge in relationship to the way you think about money, the way that you feel about money, or the way that you act in regards to your money. And just like traditional anxiety, it doesn't discriminate. So a lot of people, George, do what you did and go, well, financial anxiety must be for folks who have a lack of money. But what we know is that it cuts across all socioeconomic statuses, and you can have financial anxiety and experience it even if you are what somebody from the outside might perceive as a person who shouldn't have financial anxiety. And that's where it gets really complicated because we have this myth in our culture that the more money you have, the happier you'll be, or you won't experience worries, or you won't have anxiety. So when clients of mine and when I talk to others outside of the therapy space share that, you know, I thought things would be better once I hit fill in the blank number, whether it's six figures or whether it's that often touted, I think it's 74K is like the tipping point of happiness. (laughs) You know, the reality is that we feel very differently about our money than just what a number in the bank tells us. So what I often like to lead with is that it doesn't matter how much you earn or how little you earn, you can experience financial anxiety. And the good news is we can do things to help dial that anxiety down so you can engage with your money in a healthy way. That's a, a great understanding there. And just like I think you you were talking to on another podcast, and, the, and I remember the host that was on that podcast shared his own therapy experience. And one of the things he said was yeah. that about anxiety, he said, anxiety is normal. And, yes. and I think sometimes it seems like we get stigmatized in this thought that, yeah, if I'm anxious about something, then, then I must not be normal. And so financial yeah. anxiety, is it, is it fair to say it's the same? You, you, even if you feel a little insecure, even if maybe, again, to that point you just raised, we don't, it's not lack of money or it's not lack of income and so forth, but we can still feel anxious and that's okay. We just need to don't let it overwhelm us. Yep, exactly. And you hit the nail on the head that we want to dial it down. We don't want to fully eliminate it, which sounds, again, pretty wild. Like, why yeah. wouldn't we want to experience anxiety or why why would we not want to have anxiety? And it's the reality is it's, it's an emotion. It's an emotion just like every other emotion, good, bad, and, and all the things in between. And one of the beautiful things about you know, living our lives is experiencing a variety of emotions. And we know that anxiety and stress in limited, short-term, time-limited doses, so to speak, isn't bad for us. It's when it is chronic or when it gets in the way of our ability to live our lives that it becomes problematic. So what we want to do is learn how to cope so we can engage with whatever is going on. Because what tends to happen in regards to financial anxiety is somebody goes, oh my gosh, I'm feeling anxious about my money. And they kind of go to one of two ends of the spectrum of either I'm going to avoid it because feeling anxious feels really uncomfortable. So if I avoid my money or I procrastinate, I temporarily reduce the feeling of being anxious. Or we go to the other side and kind of over consume to try and control the situation in the hopes that we dial down our anxiety that way. So if we just learn how to kind of cope with it and, and get it into, you know, therapists will call it a window of tolerance, right? So the, yep. the ability that you have to be able to tolerate feeling uncomfortable and make wise choices, then we're in good shape. 
Okay, that that's great. And you know, it kind of leads me to kind of another thing that I I believe you and I talked about uh, here a, a couple of weeks ago. And this was another kind of surprise to me, and it's kind of on the other end of the, the spectrum, as we were talking about earlier, as far as the, not the lack of money, but you have, so like, for example, right now, you have a lot of people who are out of work, um, and you have a lot of people who are just fine. They, they're gainfully employed, uh, their businesses are, are doing okay, uh, they have money in the bank, yes, they've been impacted by the market volatility, but they're doing fine. But yet, mm-hmm. they have something else that's that I thought was really interesting you and I talked about, which was survivor's guilt. And, yeah. and, and yeah. so that was something I never expected to, to really hear. So well, what exactly is that? And how does that manifest itself? And in, in otherwise, you would think would people would be fine? Yeah, so it, it came up when we were talking about about a month or six weeks ago, I started noticing this trend of folks who were able to continue to work, even if it was working from home, or if they were an essential worker, that they were kind of feeling bad, like why hadn't they been as impacted? And I was spending some time thinking about why, why might that be? And I thought about it through the lens of what we know about trauma. So right now, I think it's fair to say that we're experiencing a fair level uh, of stress and anxiety and trauma on a certainly a national scale and definitely um, tipping into the into a global trauma experience. And when we think about trauma for something, say like a car accident, we know of a concept called survivor guilt. And the idea is if you're in a car accident and one person, let's say you walk away with, you know, a scrape or a bruise or a bump, but another person loses their life, we see that it's common for the person to survive to start kind of beating themselves up about it. Like, why did I survive? What could I have done differently to have prevented it? And I noticed that it, if I put it on the lens of what we are experiencing with our money and with our income, there was a theme of financial survivor guilt. And so the way that it might look right now is if you are one of the, depending on what study you're looking at, 75 to 80% of people in the U.S who hasn't lost their job or who hasn't lost their income, you might be experiencing financial survivor guilt if you're questioning why your income has been saved when others haven't or having kind of thoughts kind of go pop in and out of your head about could I have done something differently and feeling just burnt out or numb or or immobilized on, on what's going on right now. So I noticed that there was some financial survivor's guilt of people kind of beating themselves up for not having been as impacted as others. Got it. So that, that's very helpful. And so, you know, as we kind of shared when we were first uh, had a conversation, you know, the kind of the goal of your life simplified is to help people, you know, hear, uh, you know, listen to a topic and kind of learn from that topic about things that, that would help simplify their life. And when we think of financial anxiety, um, what are some things that would be indicators that you might be experiencing financial anxiety to the level that you need to maybe pay more attention to or to uh, start coping with a little bit more effectively? What are some key things that people might want to be looking out for? Or maybe yeah. maybe differently said, people that are from the outside looking in that maybe your friends or family, you know, might you look for in other people? Mm. Uh, it's, so it's really interesting, that second part of the question of what can you do if you're on the outside looking in? And what we know is that there's still so much stigma around talking about money. It's still such a big taboo that it's hard for family and friends to bring it up with others. So I think it's important for us as individuals to start to check in with where where financial anxiety tips from being a a helpful thing of, oh, I'm a little anxious, let me look up this particular product or service, and that will dial down my anxiety to, oh, I'm so anxious that I am totally avoiding my bank account. I think when we look at it from a mental health perspective, a key distinction between experiencing an emotion and having a diagnosis is the impact on a person's ability to function. So for example, I'm not diagnosing, I'm just sharing some information. So it's okay and normal to be sad, but if your sadness gets in the way of your ability to go to work, to take care of people, to engage in day-to-day activities, then you're gonna wanna get an evaluation for something like depression. And of course, that's like a gross um, simplification, but it helps to illustrate the idea of, 
it's okay to feel anxious about money, but if you're feeling so anxious about money that you are unable to engage in it and you are maybe not paying your bills or not looking up your interest rate or not contributing to retirement, if you are avoiding interacting with your money, then that is probably a sign that it's time to do some digging into what's going on so you can start to have a healthier relationship with your money. Thanks again for downloading this episode of Your Life Simplified, which is produced by Mariner Wealth Advisors. And at Mariner Wealth Advisors, we're here to serve as your advocate. We help people chart a course to reach their personal and financial goals so that they can have greater peace of mind that may lead to a more fulfilling life. We do this by always putting our clients first. Because as fiduciaries, we're required to provide guidance that's in the best interest of clients, not in the best interest of a company or shareholders or anyone else. So as you listen to this podcast and have questions about maybe your own financial situation or would simply like a second opinion or even you have an idea for a future podcast, please go ahead and email us at podcast at marinerwealthadvisors.com. If you found the information on this podcast valuable, please go ahead and share it with a friend or family member that you think might benefit from this information. And please don't forget to subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss an episode. Thanks for listening. And now back to the episode. What are things that we can do today to help uh, ourselves cope a little bit more effectively? I think one of the, the things that I like to share with people is just to be really compassionate and kind towards your thoughts and examine how true are they. So when it comes to an anxious thought about money, such as I'm too dumb to ever understand it, how true is that? And how kind is that? And the when we can kind of examine it from a neutral, compassionate, curious place, it's easier to kind of sort out what is just a feeling and what is a fact. So if we take that statement and we go, how true is that? We, we want to start kind of building the evidence for that thought. What evidence that do you have that you're terrible with money? What evidence do you have that you're actually not too bad with money or you're capable of learning about money? And once we have some of that evidence available, then we can start to take that anxious thought and move it from unhelpful and negative to more neutral slash positive. So instead of I'm terrible with money, we might go, you know, I'm a little bit anxious about planning for my retirement and I'm really good at managing my money month to month. I wonder if I can take some of those skills of managing my money month to month to learn a little bit more about how I can increase my retirement contribution, for example. So really helping to paint a broader picture. And once we start to replace those negative thoughts with neutral or positive ones, then our actions can start to get on board as well. And then, of course, you'll be creating new habits along the way as well, which will continue to solidify those things as you move forward. You know, it sounds very similar, you know, when, when working with, with clients, you know, in a financial, you know, wealth management engagement, we're, we're going through the goal discussion, you know, prioritizing the goals as we kind of go forward and, and helping them manage that as they go on, on a forward going basis. And whenever we hit blips, like the one we're hitting right now, as an example, we always acknowledge that, yes, I, I understand how you feel about that, but let's look at what that really means. And I think as you just kind of right. said, what, how we validate that. And so um, I, I give right. you an example. So, at, you know, with the height of the, you know, the market, when I look at where my portfolio went after, after we had, you know, went into this whole scenario, that, the economic scenario that we're currently in, um, I can look at that and I can say, you know what, it, it, it's, I, I'm down 25%, you know, uh, year to date. Not a great feeling for sure. But then I took a step back and I said, okay, but what does that really mean? What is it? What does it being down twenty five percent really mean to me personally? And mm-hmm. so I started. I went back and I looked at. Okay, where did my where where's my goal? Did my goal change? Did my did the fact that you know I'm trying to reach you know a particular goal in a certain amount of time did did that get impacted at all? And as I went back and I actually looked at my my forward projections from five years ago, I discovered that I'm still ahead of where I should have been. Uh, where, where I where I needed to be, and and so the powerful thing for me, the empowerment was that you know, in working with my clients and helping them do the same thing, is that even when we have blips like this, we need to look at the long term. We need to look at what does it really mean in context of your own personal situation. Yeah, it doesn't feel great because this is where you were, but. That was kind of icing in that sense. You just don't have as much icing as you had before. And we know that you're not supposed to be out a lot of icing off a cake anyway, right? 
so anyway, you get the sugar crash later. Uh, so that that is really helpful, and so I, I appreciate that. You know, I can imagine right now people are listening to this and, and they're kind of thinking, yeah, I, I, maybe what are, what's that line of demarcation of when it's overwhelming and maybe just I know you kind of said that a little bit earlier, but just to kind of reinforce this. The level of re, of overwhelmingness to it's you're still open. Okay, and just do these steps over here versus calling somebody to get help. So, wh- what's yeah. that yeah. line? So I and I, this is going to be a therapist answer, George. And okay. it, and it depends, but I would okay. say if your worries about money are impacting your sleep, right? You're you're up all okay. night. You're spinning in your head. Your thoughts are going a million miles a minute. Or when you're at work, you're unable to shut it off, or those thoughts seem like they're kind of bouncing into your head, uh, almost as intruders. You know, if it if the money stuff and the anxiety about money is popping in in unwanted ways, that's probably a cue that it's financial anxiety. And you know, okay. I notice I'm saying thoughts, but it also can show up for other people in their physical sensations. They might always feel a pit in their stomach when they log into their bank account. Or they might find themselves feeling a little short of breath when they go in to meet with their CFP. So we can also kind of notice those physical sensations. Are they showing up more often than usual or in during times when it's not super appropriate? Um, so for sure, you know, working through the thoughts is key. But then also, if you're experiencing it in a more physical way, I think one of the easiest things to do is just do the opposite of what you're feeling. So if you're feeling your jaw clench and your muscles tense, trying to just invite them to relax, take a few deep breaths, try to just kind of regulate your your physical sensations so you can think a little bit more clearly. That's a really great point. I, I've heard that particular piece very, very often for a lot of different things. Take a step back, yeah. take a deep breath and refocus and then come at it again, yeah. if you will. So that, that's really great information. So Lindsay, I imagine that, you know, somebody listening today, you kind of shared, you know, kind of things to watch out for, things that you can do to empower yourself uh, to move forward. Um, but in the event that someone does need help, and I know you're licensed in Michigan, so people are, are you know, there's only 50 of you in the course in, in this country. If people really did need to sit down and speak with someone about this, um, what do you recommend that they do? And who do you recommend they, they look for uh, when they're reaching out? Yeah, I think I think the nice thing, even though, yes, there's only 50 financial therapists, there are a lot of people that can help with these issues. So if you're experiencing a ton of anxiety, an anxiety therapist can certainly help out. If you find yourself needing to be a kind of person who needs a lot of knowledge about your money and a lot of planning, that's when hiring a CFP who can really sit with you and be compassionate and empathic can be hugely powerful. So I think you can go in either direction, even if a financial therapist isn't available to you. That's really great because I know, you know, the certified financial planners, you know, they they do go through a level of training that kind of helps them with that side of the conversation, if you will. So that's really helpful. Well, thanks so much. I appreciate you sharing all of that information. This has been very, very helpful. And before we conclude today, I do want to take a moment and and think about, you know, when we look at all the things that we do in our life, we learn from everything that we do. And so that's why we have one question that we like to ask all of our guests. And that is, what's the biggest money lesson you've learned in life? And help us learn from that as well. I think one of the, the biggest takeaways that I find myself coming back to you know, just personally and having been in this line of work is that money stuff is complicated, but it doesn't have to be. And with that, just being really gentle with yourself that it isn't too late to start on this work. There are still things that you can do regardless of your age or income to help move you towards a healthier relationship with money. So so just be really gentle with yourself and there's always room to improve and to feel better about money. That's great. I, I appreciate that very much. And, and ho- hopefully a lot of people are, are taking a cue from the lessons you've learned as well. So thanks for being here. I appreciate yeah. it. Appreciate you taking the time. I know you're oh, a busy, pleasure. busy person. It's great to have you here. <laughs> Well, thanks again for listening today. We hope you found the information valuable. As always, we love to hear from you. So let us know how we're doing by giving us some feedback. And if you have any ideas for future podcasts, be sure to let us know that too by emailing us at podcast at marinerwealthadvisors.com. As always, we encourage you to share the podcast with family and friends. And of course, don't forget to subscribe. Otherwise, you'll miss the next episode of Your Life Simplified. We look forward to being with you again soon. Wealth 
Advisors, or MWA, is an SEC-registered investment advisor with its principal place of business in the state of Kansas. Registration of an investment advisor does not imply a certain level of skill or training. MWA is in compliance with the current notice filing requirements imposed upon registered investment advisors by those states in which MWA maintains clients. MWA may only transact business in those states in which it is notice filed or qualifies for an exemption or exclusion from notice filing requirements. Any subsequent direct communication by MWA with a prospective client shall be conducted by a representative that is either registered or qualifies for an exemption or exclusion from registration in the state where the prospective client resides. For additional information about MWA, including fees and services, please contact MWA or refer to the Investment Advisor Public Disclosure website at www.advisorinfo.sec.gov. Please read the disclosure statement carefully before you invest or send money.